Hello, everyone. It is Professor Hamamoto. It is July 9, year 2023, 4 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Welcome one, welcome all. In particular, the people here in the live chat room, thank you very much for joining me on such short notice. But just as a program note, I'm typically on each Sunday at uh, 4 p.m. at this time. And uh, I've been running about 80 minutes, perhaps even an hour and a half. I try to keep it under 90 minutes. Um, and uh, the reason I cut back from my schedule of, I guess I maintain that for about two years is, uh, and I was doing two a week, is that I wanted to do uh, a show that, that could go beyond 60 minutes when it warranted uh, an extended type of uh, investigation. And, and many of my talks have done so. And secondly, I've been, as most of you know, especially my supporters on Patreon, most of you know that um, I'm diligently working on a another book. This one I'll probably self-publish. And it's about the high crimes and misdemeanors of the American primarily. I might range into Canada, but it's primarily the U.S. we're talking about here. The crimes and uh, misdemeanors of the university, the U.S. Uh, college and university. And I'm making some pretty good progress on it, but it requires extended, dedicated time. Toward that end, I think this talk here will be able to fit into this book that I'm working on. I don't know how many chapters it's going to be. It's not going to be a long book, but I have, as I think at last count, about 140 different case studies that I've been taking notes on for the last several years. But this definitely could fit in there because, as you know, uh, psychology uh, is very much intertwined with, uh, especially today, with the academic enterprise, I've spoken more than once about a uh, psychotherapist who uh, moved in my my um, department. She took, an, in fact, in my whole building, the different departments there, uh, they brought in psychotherapists. So students would associate the um, academic enterprise primarily with psychotherapy and not the relationship between professor and student. And that's where most of the hiring has been going on. Uh, and it's not just uh, a matter of, of jobs and uh, the fact that I feel that the profession of um, the professoriate is being undermined. In certain cases, it certainly has brought it upon itself, and including psychotherapy, to allow it to metastasize in such a fashion that it's going to take. It already has taken over, I'm afraid. It can be recovered. Right. Just like people can recover from cancer, we can recover from the psychoanalytic establishment, which has taken over academia. What do you think CRT comes from? Critical race studies, so-called, and GLBTQ. It comes, from, it comes from that world. And some of you may already know this. And part of this talk also is to go beyond naming names. Right. And it's going to, right, because I'm going to tell you right up front. I have to tell you up front. If you're new to this channel, this is not going to be one of those lightweight Jordan Peterson type. Um, um, well, I'll try to keep the profanity out of the circle jerks, I guess is, is okay, right? It makes you feel, you don't, you don't really know what he said, but it sure makes you feel good because he's so good at moralizing. Um, so don't, don't, don't prematurely try to understand what I'm, I'm going way Beyond, in fact, he's part, he's part of one of the pro, uh, part of the problem. He's a manifestation of the problem that I've been diagnosing for years now. And and, I'm, and, and again, no one will listen to me till it's too late. And, and after it's infected our all our incident, not just academia, but corporations, the military. What do you think uh, General Milley wants to make his uh, soldiers walk around in in, uh, in high heel shoes, right? We see the signs everywhere, and it's coming from a specific geopolitical, cultural, religio-ethnic 
identifiable, historically identifiable uh, cohort, right? Why is this important? Because most people walk, including people in academia, uh, walk around with the idea that there's just these visitors from outer space. And they just fairy dust comes down and, and the world changed magically. No, through cultural forensics, we have to reverse engineer it, find out where it comes from. And then once we understand its cultural and historical genesis, then we can begin to dismantle this edifice these Babylonian towers, these pyramids to atheism, these uh, monuments to self human self-destruction, right? Because that is the end game without seeming to exaggerate. The whole Gnostic uh, tradition and the, um, the uh, thrust of the Sabbatean Francus, they're very similar. Uh, tradition is to undermine the very nature of God's handiwork, including humanity itself. And that is where, where psychotherapy, so-called psychology, originates. All right, many of you know this, but I think we have to foreground that discussion. And that's the reason why I'm tackling this, yes, admittedly sensational topic of the Sullivans. And if you want to read about them, Go ahead, be my guest. There's been articles about them since the mid 80s and they're still up there and there's tons of stuff on YouTube, but they're not going to probe it in the way that I do. Right. At the same time, this is not just clickbait. Right. The Sullivan Group, the Sullivan Institute, so-called, is emblematic of this deep seated problem that goes way beyond this kinky sex cult in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Right back then, you know, there was a sprinkling of Bohemian types who can afford to live there and hippies, you know, in the late 60s and 70s, and maybe some artists who aren't getting the huge Guggenheim grants or the MacArthur, you know, they've been bought off by the state and the foundation so that they can sell their their work at highly inflated prices for money laundering pro processes. Well, that's how they managed to locate in the Upper West Side. So don't think it's we're talking about today's Upper West Side, which is the high rent district. You and you and me, or any most people in the country, uh, in America, uh, could not live there, right? You have to be amongst the elite. And the reason I mention it is because um, uh, the elites themselves fall prey to their own little schemes, and that's true with with most of the membership of the West Side, uh, the Upper West Side hoity-toity group of the Sullivan Institution. You have to be an earner in order to get in there. Kind of probably similar to, just as a frame of reference, similar to the um, Nixium group. Or have we already forgotten about Creith Renier, the self-described genius? He supposedly did have an IQ objectively, but he liked to flaunt the idea that he was so brilliant. You know, of course, he'd been set up by probably the Seagram family, because a couple of them were involved, uh, not Seagram, a Bronfman behind Seagram, right? Uh, the Seagram brand, right? At least it, um, in its origins, right? I, and that's speculation on my part, so don't sue me. If you did, <laughs> you're not going to get much money, because I purposely uh, made sure that, um, that, uh, that uh, I never accumulated enough money for people to go after me on that level. They could never put me out of business. <laughs> right? I took the. That's why uh, uh, we, we take the, the the vow of poverty, chastity, and chastity, and obedience. Right when we entered into the hermetic life of the academic world, um, is because we're we're beyond the earthly attachments, and uh, it also makes it more difficult for us to be blackmailed and tortured. Right, because we really have nothing to give up. Um, but at the same time, you have these these creatures who have infiltrated academia and made it into a profit center. Uh, and psychotherapy was the first area outside of the hard sciences, right? Biochemistry and uh, computing sciences, the uh, the the hard side, right? The hard sciences. 
their first really soft-sided and soft-skulled, really soft-minded behavior science to really parlay their their whole scheme into a huge money-making enterprise. You got to admire them for their scamosity. I just invented a word, right? Because the foundations of their pseudoscience, well, there is no foundation. <laughs> I should, you know, I, I'm begging the question when I refer to it as a foundation. Uh, it's it's air, it's air, but air sells, right? Because we need air, we need to breathe, we need to feel good, we need to have a sense of security, right? And let's just stay within this little circus ring, and I'll say, yeah, you've heard about the Abraham Maslow hierarchy of needs. These guys are are brilliant. If they weren't coming up with these terms and these phrases and these feel good books, uh, in the so called psychology field, they would be Madison Avenue types. And there's, there's no it's no coincidence that psychology, behavioral science, and, and advertising and manipulation and propaganda are like that. Right? You know the story of Edward Bernays and his uncle Sigmund Floyd? I don't have to review it to you, right? The, the historical connections are there. They're plentiful. And the Sylvanians, the people behind it, uh, exploited decades of behavioral science and psychology insights into human beings. Because I'm not discarding the fact that some of these, the great thinkers, as well as the secondary and tertiary thinkers, and believe me, I've read my share of self-help books myself. Okay, <laughs> to be redundant, self-help books myself. Um, beginning in the 70s, because they that's when they really started hitting the market, if anybody's old enough uh to remember that. Like Eric Byrne, transactional psychology. Uh, I guess what he called her transactional psych analysis. His his big book was I'm okay, you're okay. All right. I think I'm going to come up with my own self book called uh I'm okay, you're so so. Right, just so it doesn't sound, you know, too much of a uh, narcissistic, let's say. But on and on and on, okay. And and I'm telling you this is because the Sullivanians and, and that whole movement through the late 70s to, well, I'd say probably late 60s, 70s. I kept got to get the timeline straight. They they were around quite a long time. They and and. Um, Newton himself is his name is um, I get it confused because um, he was born Saul Bernard Cohn, but he went by Saul Newton. I don't think he even liked to use his middle initial or even say his middle name uh, Bernard. Maybe he thought it was sounding quote unquote too Jewish, right? But uh, he's a Cohen. He's a Cohenian. He might have been from a rabbinical line. But he's another one of these many people who are in, in this field at the time, maybe not so much today, right, who anglicize his name in order to uh, disguise the, these rabbinical, heretical, rabbinical roots. That's what Sab Sabbatean Frankism is a heresy within uh, Judaism. Talk to any Orthodox rabbi or even maybe reform rabbi, and uh, he will tell you the same thing. It's not just me saying that. And they're embarrassed and ashamed by it, uh, rightfully so, um, because they've done a, a great deal of destruction to uh, modern society through some of its um, executors, like uh, Sigmund Freud himself, who comes from a rabbinical line. He's a her heretic. You know, if he had only stuck with Judaism, it, it would have been fine. But no, he had to go against God. He had a big problem. He wrote this. I mean, it's a brilliant book for the wrong reason. Moses and monotheism, okay? He wanted to you know, talk about uh, killing the fathers. Like he, he, you know, he wanted to slay Father God. This is Sigmund Holly. If I have a chance, I'll show you a, an excerpt. And his, and his uh, daddy's little girl, Anna Holly, who migrated to the United States, New York City, which I've spoken about before in earlier talks. This is a theme that keeps coming back to haunt me because I had to fight these people right in my own department. And uh, hallelujah, guess what? I won. 
I want. I drove out these Asian American mental health specialists. One of them was named Stan Sue, S-U-E. And if you watch this piece I did when I was on suspension on psychology, I might post it on this channel. It's worth one. You'll see my whole rundown on the Sue brothers. And then there was his henchman, Nolan Zane. And their whole idea was to get uh, Asian Americans who are uh, culturally and historically removed from the whole uh, psychoanalysis is a central European ethnic specific endeavor that became professionalized and institutionalized. Do you understand that? It would be as if I said, okay, from here on out, everybody is going to eat Japanese food, right? Everybody, no, no, nothing else on the menu. Japanese food everywhere. So if you do go to a Japanese restaurant, do you see someone there, the sushi chef? You know, instead of a tuk, he's wearing a yarmulke. You will never see that. All right. So it's the same way with psychotherapy. It's really an ethnic specific Arav Rav Sabatian Frankist ethnic specific profession that's been institutionalized and fetishized and professionally rewarded. And it's undermining the very foundations of American society. Right. I won't say Western civil, but it's definitely on, right because everybody's mentally ill. Everybody's on meds. Everybody's on psychotropics. Everybody's in some sort of therapeutic modality. Isn't that true? I'm not because I like being crazy. Please join me. It's a lot of fun. You saw, you look at the world in an in a utterly, radically different way. And my gosh, it's free. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me go Peter Laurie on you, okay? Um, so yeah, I I I compare psychotherapy to Japanese restaurants, right? And Benihana is not Japanese food; it's Orientalism, it's just like a panda. And by the way, Benihana, Rocky Aoki, and all of his little kids they they set up in business like the DJ, and there's a. There's the actor, actress, whatever. Rocky Oki didn't know anything about Japanese food. He was set up. He's a figurehead. All right. He was just here running through. They said, oh, yeah, we're going to make Benny Han into a really good cash cow. Anyway, so that's not the Japanese. right? I'm talking about, you know, the ones in the home country, right? <clears throat> so anyway, we'll, we'll get into it. I'll explain to this, right? And, um, and I've been reading up on it. You know, I never stopped trying to learn. Uh, it's a pretty good book. It's shorter than I thought it would be. It's very, very dense, though. Not dense means stupid, but but it's very it's packed with information. I, it, I, it's it's uh, brevity is deceptive. It's you know 240 pages or 150 pages uh, because you got to unpack it. And, and there's more and it's not an academic book. Um, my first Exposure to the idea of the Irav Rav was not Rosie O'Donnell, but it was an academic book called Mixed Multitudes. And it's about how a certain bloodline entered um, the, the diaspora led by uh, Moses. Yes, Moish, Moish, right? Moises in Espanol, right? That mo the biblical Moses, um, in... Um, in defiance against God, he said, don't bring those people along. And they, are, they are trouble. And, and uh, according to certain rabbis, and they're, they're on YouTube now. It's a really good lectures that I watch. Uh, even Hollywood celebs are into it. Um, um, uh, Roseanne, Roseanne Barr is, um, is talking about it. She said, do not call them Jews. They're not Jews. <laughs> they're, they are the uh, Rev. Rob. So when I'm talking about these psychoanalytic types and their publishers like Lyle Stewart, who was just an anglicized name as well. He wasn't born Lyle Stewart. I forgot his. Oh, he was born Lyle Simon. Okay. Um, my suspicion is that they come from that um, that part of the diaspora of the Iraf Raf. Right, that, that I'm trying to put into the language now, right? 
because it's anthropological. It's in the Bible. It's biblical, but it's anthropological, scientific, fact, and theological fact. Because Orthodox rabbis are talking about it, because they're saying oh, we as a people, Jews, contemporary, we are destroying ourselves. We are asking for divine retribution, and they and so they have to explain to their 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 fellow. Um, Jews that hey this this is how it happened this is what we got from here to there so we need uh, rectification correction healing tikkun right there was a guy Michael Lerner who was a you know stone cold leftist new left sixties type you know Abby Hoffman well not as bad as that but he was of that generate Abby Hoffman they were all the Rav Rav by there are a lot of them they were way overrepresented in the nineteen sixties counterculture and radical politics. And there's another reason for that. And it's because they are descendants of the Bolsheviks or Bolsheviks, Bolsheviki, you know, their parents and maybe grandparents who fled uh, what is today, you know, Russia, but, you know, this is before the uh, Russian Revolution, fled what is today modern Ukraine, Russia, Central Europe, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Central European. And that's why I say that psychotherapy, and of course, parts of Germany and Austria, Central Europe, that's why I say that psychotherapy is an ethnic specific um, practice, right? And people who are not of that background who are forced by your insurance company and by your worker workplace your employer because my employer told me says listen we're 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 going to go lighter on you we're only going to take away half of your pay for one year if you undergo psychotherapy and i said Egh. yeah do you understand this body language yeah I said no way um, and I'm telling you that not just to show you what a martyr I am, is that don't take that off of yourself. You'll regret it because that's going to go on you and your, your kid, whoever warned them, do not take the, oh, we're going to put you in therapy, something just, no, 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 just reject it out of hand because then you're on their turf. You've consented to enter into their world. So it's an ethnic specific central European uh, practice just like Japanese food. Take any cuisine, Mexican food, um, uh, Korean cuisine, French, you know, cuisine is specific to that particular group. That's your specialty. And why, you know, uh, why are we being forced? Like I'm at the university, I have to like uh, subscribe to Erav Rav psychotherapy. It's not my world. I don't believe in psychotherapy. That's not my God. I do believe in the God of Abraham, but I do not believe in atheism, who's who's the pseudo God of uh, a Floyd, and it also holds true for Christian Kabbalists, like uh, El Professor Carl Gustav Jung, who's by the way was Swiss. He was an Austrian, so forgive the accent. Uh, he's Christian. I mean, again, he was one of these heretics. He comes from a long line of. Uh, of ministers, these are all people who had problems with their daddy. They wanted to kill him, and they had they so they 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 developed a brilliant self-referential, self-validating uh, pseudoscience that is the predominant form of experience to the world for Americans. We don't go to church anymore, of course, maybe deservedly so, because most of those people who are up there in the pulpit telling us how to live our lives are part of that world themselves. It's that per pervasive. So this is a, this is a long-term project that we do to, to um, decolonize our mind, right? We, we have to, to, to start with a mass exodus with a capital E, a second exodus 2.0, an exodus of the mind and the soul from this from the slavery of central european sabatine frankist erav rav um psychotherapeutic slavery right i'm not moses i'm not the one who's going to lead you to the promised land of course moses never made it 
to the promised land because God punished him for disobeying him about allowing the Rav, Rob to come along. He said, okay, Moish, you didn't listen to me. These guys are trouble. And look at like 5,000 years, they're still making trouble. You didn't listen to me. We could have avoided all this. We wouldn't be at war in Ukraine and Russia, right? The Rothschilds would never run, uh, got to the top. Neither would the Rockefellers. But you wouldn't listen to me, Moish. Listen to me now. I'm not the Mishak. I'm not the Messiah. You know, I wanted to become a comedian, yes, and to the point where I was going to change my name to Shlomo. Shlomo Hamamoto. You know, I had dreams of being on the Ed Sullivan show. You know, because, you know, I grew up on Alan Scheumann. You remember Alan Scheumann? Hello, mother. Hello, father. <laughs> I mean, I memorized all those. Okay. By the way, that's part of the, because I'm not, you know, one-sided here. I want to bring the true balance, the contribution of those, because they weren't all bolshies and they weren't all the Rav Rob. There were people like Alan Scheumann's folks, hardworking people. All right. And I'm not the one that's saying this only. I'll let me refer you to a really good book I can recommend without reservation, Diana West. It's called The Red Thread. And look at the red rope. Runs right through the White House. They should call it the Red House. I know the Obamas wanted to call it the Rainbow House. but uh, And they want to turn it back into the Rainbow House when they put Mike in office back there. Right? Her, his husband, Mike. But she's, you know, details quite a bit. I don't know if you can read this or it's even necessary. Um, I thought this segment was so important, the um, contents and some of the material here. Um, she talks about the red influence and the Bolshevik influence, which I've already alluded to. Let me see. Exit full screen. All right. Read it yourself. It's 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 well worth. God, it's. I, look, I just checked on, on Amazon. It's something like it's under ten dollars, um, but it explains to you what I was just summarizing when I was getting warmed up here. I'm still in the warm up phase. Hang on, we're going to get to the sex cult because I know some of you are out there who are tourists and don't know my pedagogical style. Are saying, when is he going to start talking about the nasty group sex? When is he going to be talking about the polygamy? When is he going to be talking, you know, all the salacious stuff? Like I said, you can find that on TubeU. You. you can read the articles about it, you know, and you can get off on it however you like. I think the whole, the, the, the significance of the Sullivan Institute runs much deeper than that. And that's why I'm taking such a long time and trying to explain to you why I even tackled this topic. And I'll have to handle it because, you know, or hand it to uh, Dr. Todd Grande because, you know, I like to tease him, right? Not he doesn't know who I am, but I like to make fun of him. I, I am still, I'm still quite um, uh, amused by him. But, but he does draw the connection between, specifically between the Sullivan Institute and its left-wing connection, which I call Bolshe. That's what uh, people refer referred to as Bolsheviks in a kind of a disparaging, condescending way, especially in England, they call them Bolshies, like a Roger Waters. You know, I don't like the fact he's been censored and being being canceled and harassed and all that. Uh, I thought his little, and do think that his little extravaganza and his concept albums are a little juvenile, right? It's probably for like meant for the level of 13 year olds who are beginning to discover, oh, the government's dangerous. It's oppressive. You know, they're just beginning to understand that the world's not about them and and that there are all these dark forces out there. But he's a bolshe. Okay, he is a bolshe. I'm talking about Roger Waters now. I don't know about uh, Gilmore. I think Gilmore is, uh, he's a great guitarist. Uh, his book, his father was a professor, by the way. He, he left England. He, he emigrated to America. And so he doesn't talk about and they're they're Canterburyans. They're from Cambridge. They're not from London. These are they're intellectuals. So, uh, and, and Pink Floyd music is really not to my taste, even during the Sid Barrett days. Um, because because I think that there's something uh, dark in there, 
I'll find out the mention because I'm still studying Pink Floyd decades after I first heard him uh, when I was a teenager. But here's Todd Grandy talking, Dr. Todd Grandy talking about, um, and I'm not going to run the whole deal, but uh, just to give you, just to have you understand that the Sullivan Institute has attracted the attention of a wide range of people. But Dr. Todd Grandy is only is one of the few that uh, connects them to this left-wing politics bullshit. And that's what we're seeing now, right? CRT is just a stand-in for bullshit. Critical race studies and transgender, that's just a substitute for bullshit. The same people who failed to revolutionize the American working class, the same capitalists, the same money people who want to, who want to take over all the institutions in America, but fail to do so because of the middle class revolution built on true capitalism, not monopoly capitalism. Those are the same people who are behind these contemporary movements. That's what Diana West, I hope I'm not misrepresenting her, probably more like oversimplifying her argument. This is what she talks about, discusses in her great book, The Red Thread, right? And she'll do, she does it in a more meticulous and programmatic fashion that, that only books can achieve. So I, again, suggest that you take a look at it. And it'll really explain a lot to you why, why the world's so screwed up and, and more importantly, how we're going to unscrew the screw. None of this is irreversible. These are man-made problems. They were not ordained by God. They're man-made problems. And they can be made undone and unmade and, and transformed into unproblems, non-problems. They can be transformed into victories. Right? And we're seeing more and more happen all the time. I just learned that Ellen DeGeneres is is for the most part going to be gone off, off the media. Her show, The Ellen Show, which was ran for 19 years, is gone. It was canceled. I think she was, it was a CBS uh, syndicated show. I think it was in the network there. I might be wrong. I might be one of the other uh, big three networks, which are the same. They, you know, they're, they're intelligence operations. You know that by now. I have really smart people who are subscribers on my channel. So, you know, I don't have to go into the story of the um, origin of the American uh, media networks, uh, television and the newspaper chains and all that. Uh, and I didn't realize this, but her, uh, she had a kitty show based on a character called Ellen. I guess it was her when she was a child. And it had that creepy kitty porn feel to it. I never watched it, before, but that was canceled by HBO. Why, why am I telling you this? Because this type of discussion and the proliferation of this information, this dissemination of this information creates a what's called a climate of opinion that's favorable to us, right? And I don't have to resort to these trendy uh, terms like meme or warfare or whatever it is. It's, it's or mind wars or info wars, whatever it is or counter propaganda. No, it's just the sharing. It's called education. That's what it is. It's, it's so simple. And that's how all the different civilizations that are with us today, that's how they survive to the present. They, they had good education system. I'm talking about tribal people. You know, I'm not talking about the, the state level people. We have crappy education. I'm talking about the people who are educating themselves, their, their children, and their families according to their precepts, not according to someone who runs the Department of Education, right? These mixed multitudes at, who run the federal autocracies that control us. So here, let, be, let me talk, let me show you. My friend, my newfound friend, Dr. Todd Grandy. I know I make fun of him, but in this case, he's, he's spot on. Dr. Grande, today's question is, can I analyze the case of Saul Newton and the Sullivanians? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. 
then I'll offer my analysis. Saul Newton was born in St. John, New Brunswick, Canada, on June 25, 1906. He attended the University of Wisconsin and the University of Chicago. In college, Saul started to develop extreme left-wing beliefs. He considered himself to be a communist. Saul fought in the Spanish Civil War and in World War II. When his service was complete, he informally studied psychotherapy. At some point, Saul married a woman named Dr. Jane Pierce. Unlike Saul, she did have formal training in psychotherapy. Saul and Jane worked at an institute in New York City that was co-founded by a well-known psychiatrist and psychoanalyst named Harry. Okay, we might return to him in a moment, but that's a lot of information to uh, to footnote or on my part. That's my function here. That last character there, White, he was the guy, I believe, that was was the superintendent or the head, I don't know what his formal title was, at St. Elizabeth's uh, Psychiatric Facility in Maryland, in D.C. area, where Eustace Mullins was held, right? I did a whole talk on Eustace Mullins as being one of the progenitors of what you might call New World Order theory. He was the guy that was, he was one of the most plagiarized people around even by people on our side supposedly who are these snap experts on the federal reserve oh yeah fiat currency right that that was eustace mullins uh, who was the research institute or research assistant to uh eustace mullins who was incarcerated because of his political beliefs he was not a fascist and by the way that's a misnomer too um what was going on in europe was a form of national, um, not national socialism. That was their ally, um, Germany. But it, but it was socialism, right? It's called fascism to obscure the fact that it was a socialist, organized, state-run organization. And I mention that is because, time and time again, socialist uh, political institutions fail. They fail and, and to disastrous levels, if you want to talk about National Socialist uh, uh, Germany, right? We call them the Nazis because uh, the left here does not want to hear their little shibboleth, which, by the way, is a Hebrew word. Was it Hebrew? Yeah, shibboleth. Um, they don't want their shibboleth, uh, socialism or socialismus, right? They don't want to utter in, in the reference to to Nazi Germany. It's embarrassing, or, or to to um, to Italy during uh, World War II, right? But again, I'll, I'll refer you to uh, Diana West to unpack that. But anyway, that guy was the head of that Saint Elizabeth's Hospital, which, which by the way, is also held. Um, mind-controlled assassins like i think john is that john hinckley a couple of these couple of these individuals who were sensitive type prisoners were held there maybe so they couldn't talk but they couldn't kill them like jeffrey epstein but no, i don't know we can only speculate but the point is is that uh dr jane pierce and she was a medical doctor not a psychologist not a phd and saul newton who only had partial training as a professional site. In fact, his main training was a photographer, which got me to think, well, maybe that's how he was able to maintain membership in their little cult up there. Maybe he was taking photos of all these high level West. Um, well, they're not, they came from all over New York, but, but these people from the elite segment of uh, New York uh, city society, right? I don't know. We can only get, there's more work that needs to be done this done here. And that's why I don't want to focus on just the simple, salacious, sensational aspects of the cult. Because you know what? No one's talking, has spoken about this, not even Dr. Todd Grande. Because you know me, I like to be thorough. I'm not saying I always am thorough, but I strive for thoroughness. And I punish myself severely when I say, how could I have missed this? How did I overlook it, right? So I try, I do my darnest to find out. So when, uh, one of the people who are a Patreon subscriber, please subscribe to my Patreon, by the way. You'll have high level uh, 
I won't call them comrades. <laughs> you know, because I don't want to sound like a bullshit. You'll have high level peers with you on, on, on the Patreon. One of them suggested that I check this book out. And typically when people do, I only listen because, because they're a patron and I trust their judgment. But the ones who make these little comments, I, oh, I should check out Dr. Todd Grandy or have you heard of Jordan Peterson by any chance? Uh, you know, I get those types of comments from, from tourists and, and it's, very, it's irritating as you might imagine. But this person was a patron, so I, I checked it out. I bought the book. It was published in 2020. It is a brand new or fairly new, you know, close to brand new. It's uh, um, Sullivanians and, and it is good. He interviewed about 60 different people who were either ex Sullivanians or close to your family members. So he did his footwork as a journalist and he teaches at Columbia. So, you know, he's only going to be able to take it so far, folks. Right. And I think that was part of his job. Uh, in getting this contract with a mainstream New York um, firm, Farage, Gross, and Giro. I don't know who owns it now. Probably Hachette, who, you know, maybe it's uh, Springavella, some globalist uh, uh, communications conglomerate probably owns. So he can only go so far. There's another academic book, which I... I just can't pay 90 bucks for it. I'm going to have to go to the university library and check it out. You know, because sometimes even these 90 page, 90 um, dollar books, hundred dollar monograph, I can monograph. Sometimes they're, 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 they're not good. And they're, it's like you wasted your money. So I'm going to go to uh, the university, local university library and check it out because I'm not done with the Sylvanians. The sensationalists have the journalists have finished with it because you know why? You know why I'm telling you why I, why I have to be thorough and on my game? Because I ordered the book that Dr. Jane Pierce, medical doctor, and Saul Newton authored. And I wasn't expecting much, right? Because I saw all the video, most of them, on the Sylvanians, and they were really superficial. And I read the article, and I thought, oh, yeah, they were into swapping and blah, 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 blah. I mean, which cult is not? Which cult does not use sex as a control mechanism for its member as a lure, right? They all, I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that that's like a basic mind control um, 101, right? That's probably true for any institution, you know, or, you know, most of them to certain degrees, but definitely for cults. And then they get into your money. They believe me, they get. They can do the profile work, right? But anyway, to get to my point, finally, I came, I ordered this book at the same time I ordered this one. Came about the same time in my mail books. It's almost 500 page, almost 500 pages, substantial. It's called The Conditions of Human Growth. And it's authored by Dr. Jane Pierce and Saul Newton. They're co-authors. And I said, this can't be, this can't be. I thought it's going to be like, I'm okay, you're okay by by Dr. Byrne or Psycho-Cybernetics by, by um, Al, it's not not Albert Maltz. Not Mac, Albert Maltz was a left-wing bullshit screenwriter in the Hollywood tent. I can't remember his name, but his last name was Maltz. Maybe they related, I don't know. But the book was Psycho-Cybernetics, which was kind of a popularization of, the real mind control cybernetics as laid out by uh, Norbert Wiener at MIT and later disseminated within the academic world by Gregory Bateson. These are all CIA people funded, right? And his wife, Margaret Mead, who was an anthropologist, who I'm working on. I'm telling you, I'm writing, writing a book, right? These people, these people, cast of characters are all going to be in my book. And they're all kind of related to, guess who? P.K. Dick. Because he was the literary hand for the teenagers that he was writing for, whose minds and imagination and maybe even career trajectory, he was charged with the responsible to shape. And that's true of his um, peers like Paul, um, what's his name? Paul, not Paul Williams, Paul Anderson, who was a Berkeley dude as well, by the way. And they used to have dinner together. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm doing so much writing on, on 
Dick, I just he just keeps resurfacing on even the most, you know, remote topics that I'm dealing with. But anyway, I I, I looked through this book and I'm, I didn't read it cover to cover, I'm taking some notes on it, and I'm gonna going to spend more time with reading it. But the point I'm making here is, is this is a substantive academic book. No one else in these little YouTube pieces, and there's tons of them, even allude to this. So the and the point is, is that not because it's academic, the point is that, that, that the Sullivan Institute was grounded on solid, orthodox, uh, professional, according to their their own American Psychological Associate, whatever interest group, whatever lobby, professional organization they have, it was written along those the standards set by their professional peers. Okay, why is that important to understand? It's it's important to understand because you realize then that the Sullivan Institute was not a one-off. It was not aberrant. It was not just some kinky. Upper West Side sex call for rich people with nothing better to do with their money. But it was normative. Okay. Left wing, right wing, conservative. doesn't matter what Todd Grandy, where he wants to place him on the political spectrum. It's really irrelevant. What is relevant, and that this is how I let off my talk of today. It's because this is very much in the mainstream within the grain of orthodox psychoanalytic theory and practice. Do you understand that? Just like when Charles Manson said on one of his interviews, um, if you understand me, take a look in the mirror. <laughs> when you think that's just some kind of smart ass uh, remark by a mind controlled uh, himself, and it's been established, by the way, that he was one of those mind-controlled assets like Fyodor Kaczynski and Sarhan Sarhan, Sarhan Bishara Sarhan, who supposedly assassinated Robert F. Kennedy. Right? Do you think he was just being a wise guy? No. He was, he was trying to communicate a profound but disturbing truth about the real system of government governance and control in the United States of America and now the world. Because the American psychoanalytic model has infested almost every part of, of the globe. Probably the only place it hasn't been able to make any headway is in Asia. Because I told you, it's an ethnic specific deal. And if you want <laughs> you can train all the Japanese anal analysts. There's not going to be any takers because we don't do analysis, right? We would we would rather kill ourselves. We will commit seppuku, right, to preserve our honor and our pride rather than to blab our our dark secrets to utter strangers at two hundred bucks an hour. Cool, you know what kind of business model is that? That's Central European uh, rav that's that's a business model from from that's alien to Asian people, right? It's, and it's alien to to um, uh, well, I won't say the Latin wor world, you know, Latin America. It's probably very strong there, but you would think Japan would be running with. Do you know? Yeah, I lived there two different times for extended lengths, and I, I was so great. It was so great. For one thing, I never heard any of that boom boom music. Right with the big woofers, the boom, 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 boom. Never heard any of that. I said, "Oh my gosh, this is great." And you realize how how the diff, uh, the extent to which the mind control is extended to these these um, ultrasonic bass frequencies, right? which is part of the. I'm not exaggerating. This this has all been thought out, engineered, and uh, brought to the fore with the people who control rap and hip hop, from Russell Simmons to Lee R. Cohen. They're also part of the Rav Rav, not coincidentally, and they all have contacts with MIT Media Lab and and the scientists who say this is what's going to really disrupt these communities, right? Subsonic music in um, in these automobiles, right? But you don't hear that in Japan, and number two, you don't see any psychotherapists. <laughs> wow. 
yeah, I need to be out of this country more often. Because it puts, it puts a different perspective on it. So uh, I recommend you might want to do a psychotherapeutic detox. I'm not saying this is not medical suggestion because you might be severely hooked on your um, antidepressants. Right. And I don't want you to just come off any, you know, because there's a warning on that. You might have suicide ideations. You might get violent. Right. They hook you in at a very deep level. I'm talking about, you know, Purdue Pharma, right, with its opioids. Ooh, wee. Right. It's not coming from China. It's not the China virus. It's not coming from the Chakabs. It's coming from Purdue Pharma. It was founded by three medical doctors of the Arav Rav bloodlines who went to Central Europe for their MDs, where they really knew how to do pharmacy, man. They were into pharma, pharmacopoeia, which means poison. <laughs> and they brought it to the U.S. Here we are, opioid epidemic that we want to blame on the Jackams in the, in the Wuhan people. Uh, we're not going to take it. You know why they blame it on that? Because there are very few uh, psychotherapists in China as well. Probably a lot in Hong Kong because that's a arm of the British intelligence uh, network, uh, but not so much in Taiwan. Um, and it's almost it's and not so much in Hong Kong except amongst expats. Right? Well, you might say, well, it's because they worship the one party com communist uh, state. You know, like okay, right? Maybe so. But who do you worship? You worship the sin. You're 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 part of the synagogue of Satan. That's who you worship, Satan. Uh, maybe they do too, <laughs> but they they definitely know that that the psychotherapies would ruin their would would take them down, just like it took down the United States, just like it took down Britain. Okay. By the way, um, I'm not just talking out of my you know what. And I told you, I promised you I was going to give you some historical, geographic, geopolitical analysis. Um, and here, here's the book that really taught me, confirmed a lot of suspicion, but it, it's a full-blown academic study of how most of these characters came to either Britain or the United States, London or, or New York City, the Arav Rav, including Sigmund Freud, and his daughter, Anna Hoy, who wound up in New York. This is an academic book, man. This is a legit book. So Oxford University Press, 1983. Titled the book, Psychotherapy in the Third Reich. The Gilling Institute. A lot of these characters, you know how they wound up in London in New York? is because they were kicked out of... Germany. I'm not going to use the term Nazi Germany anymore. Because that's how we were taught to say Nazi Germany. It's National Socialist Germany that they came from. Right. They were socialists themselves, as I've already told you. They were Bolshies, but they weren't National Socialists. And they brought their thoughts right, and behavior and practices which they had to fight for and lobby for. There was a whole process whereby psychotherapy had to fight its way tooth and nail into the medical establishment. And there's tons of books on it, which I'm not going to bore you with. But this one here, in a nutshell, will, will tell you the backstory of how psychotherapy was identified as an ethnic, religio-ethnic, they called it Jewish science, quote unquote. And I'm not going to use that loaded phrase because that sets you up for being branded an anti-Semite. So I will use the work, the term terminology of the Orthodox rabbis who are English speaking, you know, in America here. And I'll use the term Rav Rav. Or I will sometimes use um, um, Frankist, right? Right. But 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 you get my point here. We're talking about a small group of people who say, from here on out, the orthodoxy is there will be no more McDonald's. 
you cannot worship at the golden arches. It's you'll have to go to Hamamoto's, right? I'm going to have a drive-through, a franchise, a whole infrastructure built on Japanese food, and that's all you can consume. And if you go to the university, if you get in trouble, it says, okay, ha have a bowl of miso soup. That's going to cure you. That's what they do at the university. They say, you have to go into therapy. I said, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not of that religio-ethnic background. Are you going to violate my constitutional rights by forcing me into this institution? See, we don't, it sounds weird. The argument sounds weird to you, but just think about it. It is so hegemonic that my radical spoof of it, my comedic take on it, doesn't even seem to make any logical sense. But the fact that we are compulsory, compulsory post-Freudians now is tantamount to saying that the American diet will change from hamburgers to a sushi only. And instead of eat, drinking Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola, you're going to have to drink green tea. All right. It's the analogy is very pretty pretty much appropriate. I would would agree. Just we'll we'll return to it. All right. Um. To continue, so you read up on. Um, uh, oh, there, yeah, there is one. <laughs> Some some interesting uh, connections that I draw here, and again, it 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 comes back to the Aravra. So I'm looking at this, and then I'm I'm a I'm a book person. I'm not a man of the book. People of the book are Orthodox Jews. The Rav Rav are no longer the people of the book. They're the mixed multitudes. But I am a person who's who likes books and enjoy books. So I'll read the the publication information on in the front, the frontispiece it's called. And I noticed, I said, oh my gosh, this book, which is an academic book, and, and I'm claiming, I write, think I've already told you, it's an, orth orth it's an orthodox mainstream psychology. It's not a textbook, but it is a treatise, like how to, how to treat people in a psychotherapeutic institution, right, and protocol. But I said, how can a book like this, it's published by, Citadel Press, which is a division of Lyle Stewart, right? I said, that doesn't make any sense, but it does make sense because Lyle Stewart was a pornographer, right? His name was Lyle Simon. He was a Rav Rav. Right, check him out. Well, let me, well let, me, let me see if I can put a picture up here. Yeah, I don't know if you can see it. Here he is. What a player. This is in the 50s. No man wore a beard in the 50s. It's <laughs> got a past Lyle Stewart. He was like before Allen Ginsberg. And he was like, you know, Larry. He was the Hugh Hefner of his, of his age. Hugh Hefner, the contribution of Hugh Hefner was to give it a little bit more highbrow sheen to what people like. And Lyle Stewart, people, guys like him were, he's, he's a publisher. He was friends with William F. Gaines. You know who that? He's my, William F. Gaines is my mentor from afar. He was the publisher of Mad Magazine, right? Where all these weird ideas and hippies and beatniks and uh, wife swappers and you know, as a kid, I didn't know, but that was William F. Gaines. That was his big buddy, Lyle Stewart, Lyle Simon, and William Gaines's dad was one of these comic books dudes. He ran educational comics. He's the guy that hand, hired um, Professor Marsden, Marston of Harvard University in psychology to create a shield of educational veneer for what was really ultra-violent, creepy, necrophilic, vampirish, grave-robbing, bone-diggers type of activity. Like tales from the crypt. And they said, okay, we're going to call it educational comics. Right. So Lyle Stewart said, yeah. Well, Playboy says, it's not pornography. This is a Playboy lifestyle we are bringing to the fore. Uh, at least Larry Flint was honest what he was doing. 
right? Not that I'm a fan of his, but he was also an enemy of a lot of high um, level individuals, right? Which is why he was almost murdered. He was, uh, I think, um, I don't know if he was a quadriplegic or a paraplegic, but the point is he was shot uh, by a sniper and uh, his life was difficult at that point. That's Larry Flint. And there was a movie made in the USA. It's a, it's a pretty decent biopic. So if you want to check him out, it's all part of, the, of our of our culture. It's Lyle Stewart. So Lyle Stewart published this. And, and I said, well, why? Why would a pornographer and why would these people want to associate with someone you know, from the Lower East Side, they're they're dealing with a with a Upper West Side clientele with a Lower East Side. That's you know where where all the hustlers and dopers and the pornographers are, right? Not anymore. It's just where all the yuppies are. They used to be called, and now their bankers are living there, um, and a lot of foreign capital uh, in the in the village area. Uh, it's no because the similarity is that they're bolshi. And part of the program is to destroy the nuclear family, uh, destroy monogamy, all of it. That's their sex radicals, because sex radicalism is consistent with political ra radicalism. And that is important to us in 2023, because that's what we're going through now in different packaging. Do you understand? Right, they may, may call it CRT or GLBT. They'll come up with something new. They'll probably just call, come up with something called pet li liberation, right? Which is going to be the gateway to uh, zoophilia. Yes, there is a term for it. That's where human beings have a have a kinky relationship with animals. It's called zoophilia, right? That's going to be next on the agenda. And they don't care if it succeeds or not. That is a constitutional amendment, right? They all they care is that it it creates distraction, obviously, but it also creates a sense, a um, not a sense, but the reality of a permanent political chaos and cultural chaos, right? They are a chaos machine so that Alex Jones can pick up on it and Joe Rogan and then Whitney Webb. And there's, oh, how terrible it is. Zoophilia, furries, right? These people want to, are, are saying that we should have interspecies sex, right? You should be able to sleep with uh, your monkey, you know, instead of Peter Gabriel shock the monkey. You know, there's going to be songs called sleep with your monkey. Right. Or instead of everybody's got something to hide except for me and my monkey, like John Lennon sang on the White Album, it's going to be everybody's got something to show off, including me and my monkey. Right. And it's going to make the gay pride parades and and. Uh, these little story times, it's going to make them look mild in comparison. Because they're going to be parading down in the Castro and San Francisco farm animals in aroused states, along with these nude guys with their little leather thongs. Think that's crazy? Well, 10 years ago, you would have thought that the whole GLBTQ um, ritualistic Babylonian Yerav, Rav, Frank is uh, uh, display of Harris. You would have thought that that was bizarro, but it has come to pass in, in, in Satan worship, right? After school, Satan thought, oh, that, that would never happen here. Right? So listen to me, or at least consider my thoughts and understand the, the basis of it. Understand how, how, Leave aside all the, the sexy Nazi propaganda, anti-Nazi propaganda, and I'm saying they're good people. But just live away all, just suspend that for a time and the sadistic but glamorous Nazis that we hear all the time, including. In, and then look at some of the, the factual institutional histories of the Third Reich. And then you will understand how what they got rid of was exported overseas. People complain about oh, all these immigrants coming from the South. They're being bringing in their, their alien culture and, and national. And it's like the uh, uh, population replacement. All these, you know, I'm not saying open integration is good. Okay, By my tone of voice, that's not what I'm arguing. All right, so don't pin that on me. 
but people will get upset about that. But what about the cross-border migration, infiltration, and institutionalization and to the point of being mandatory, mandatory psychotherapy? No one complains about that, do they? Because it is so pervasive. And most of the people who could have been critics are probably invested in the psychotherapeutic complex themselves. Right? So those of us who are crazy because we have never submitted to it are going to have to take the leadership position on it. We can't wait for the Department of Education or who whoever we we think is in charge, but they're not, because they're probably whacked out on psychotropics, right? Almost guaranteed, almost guaranteed. So anyway, I'm trying to lead the way here or not. I don't want to lead anything, to tell you the truth, right? I'm just pointing in that area, right? I don't have a Moses complex, you know, I don't need to even take you part way to the promise. I don't, I'm just saying, watch out. Because look what happened to Moses. As soon as Moses went to go to talk to God, the Arev Rav made a golden statue, the golden kind, the golden calf. Right? And they said, don't worship God. Here's here's the God of Israel. It's the it's the golden. He was just gone a few days. And they just said, okay. So the no wonder God didn't let him into the promise. He says, Moses, you did not, you really screwed up. And just for that, I'm not going to let you go <laughs> into the holy, into the promised land. I don't know. I'm just, you know, having a little fun with it, right? Um, okay. Also on a cultural level, um, you may not care about this. Uh, and it's probably a secondary effect of it, uh, of 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 the uh, Sullivan Institute, but, and this is something that was really fascinating to me that I learned. There's a whole chapter devoted to it. Uh, what's interesting to me is that the Sullivan Institute was really instrumental in bringing about the abomination in art history called uh, abstract expressionism, otherwise known as modern. And modern art is a little bit too generic, but, um, Who's one of the better representations? That's Jackson Pollock. If you don't know the name, you've seen the, the pictures, the drip paintings, right? It's the painting that you saw on the wall when you went to New York as a tourist. You went to the Guggenheim or the Metropolitan, or you were in San Francisco. You went to the, um, is it the Museum of Modern Art? It's the one by Market Street. Or you went to the LA County, you know, where your local... Uh, money laundering operation called the Art Museum, right? Uh, and you saw this painting there with a bunch of oil splatters up there, an action painting, so-called. And that's the where you said, hey, you know, I could do that. Or a 10-year-old, that that is Jackson Pollock. Okay, does that now ring a bell? And there have been movies made of it. There's tons of dissertations, have been biographies. He's a romantic figure. He's a tortured genius. Um you can buy all that if you want, if it's necessary. You know, the same girls that run publishing and are the readers and are the high level editors that would never give me the time of day. In fact, when they send me rejection slips, usually put some sort of nasty, bitchy quip on it. Those are the ones that are also at the art museums, right? Because their parents have to buy them a job, or find them something to do with their lives instead of just snorting cocaine and and um, joining cults like the Sullivan Institute, right? Those are the people and the critics who are also of the Arav Rav, by the way, who were who were insinuated with the with the Sullivan Institution, the art critics who created the Jackson Pollocks, not the artwork, but the individual. And later they they um uh, what one critic uh, in particular cut him loose. We don't know the real reasons for it. he, you know, he was drinking a lot and wasn't producing a lot of work. But how come all of a sudden the guy who was proclaimed to be the genius, the savior of American art, Jackson Pollock, all of a sudden became a non-person just on the 
say so of one uh, Clements Greenberg. He brought all kinds of those artists like Jackson Pollock himself, by the way, into the Sullivan Institute. So he was like a pimp. He was like a finder for the Sullivan. That's not how this author, I'm not going to mean to imply that you know, Alexander Style wrote this. This is my opinion. He was a finder. He was a pimp for the for the Institute because they're also bringing in patrons, patrons too, to, to the, uh, to the scene where they have um, group sex and hundred percent sex ray. You come to one of their parties, you're going to get, you know, what you came for. And of course, maybe there's photography and video and film. I don't get videotape at that early stage, not, not commercially available, at least. But they were they were um, you know getting the photographic evidence for the compromise. It's probably early Epstein, you know, think Epstein, right? That type of instant deal. And didn't Epi himself, Epstein, didn't he sponsor some young talent and says, Oh, I'm gonna buy your paintings or I'm gonna send you to art school? Yeah, just go look at the the uh, articles of uh, Kirby Summers. Uh, for, for the details, I can't remember them off. Or go or look at her books that are, I believe, still in print. But but the art world was very much part of what he was doing as as well. So I don't know if he knew any of the Sullivan people. I wouldn't doubt it, because they're still around. Some of them have gotten their uh, licenses restored after they was lifted. They were they were they were delicensed after the trials and scandals broke and uh, time passes, maybe money changes hands. I'm not saying, any, I'm just speculating how the world really works. You know, that's how Roy Cohen, that's, he, that was his uh, business model. Uh, but they're back in business, including one of the former wives of, um, of um, uh, Saul Newton. Right. She's around. She's got her psychotherapy license. Um, and by the way, um, you know, I don't mean to imply that all psychotherapy is bad. Some people can benef benefit from it on a short term basis. Uh, but the model, the business model, from what I understand, is to hook people in on the long term who have insurance primarily or uh, the wealth to support regular paychecks or wholesale transfer of money into their account. Right. I read an interesting article about Dr. Ralph Greenson. He was a psychiatrist, MD, in Beverly Hills. Right. He was the shrink to the stars, including his famous client, who he slept with, by the way, Marilyn Monroe. But I, just, I didn't know. This is why these themes never get old. But I read this one article is that and, and this is the author saying this, not me. I have the article. If anybody wants to sue me for slander, take it up with the person who wrote the article. I am just transmitting this information, right? But this person, this author of this article um, is um, implying, if not outright saying, that Greenson and the daughter of Sigmund Freud, Anna Freud, might have been involved with a scheme to claw Marilyn Monroe's money, her estate, to support the Anna Freud Institute, right? So you may think, oh, it's just a benign, it's a fully consenting adults, right, getting their yah-yahs out, whatever. You can make all kinds of excuses for them, and it's just sort of a one-off deal, just like the Nexium. But no, when, when we're talking about the topic I just alluded to, I won't mention these names again. Uh, out of um, courtesy to their descendants, because their their families are still living, right? And I don't want them to be stigmatized for the sins of the forefathers or foremothers, in the case of Anna Floyd. But no, a, a death, one or more deaths, because that's what the article implies, might have been involved to the funding of it. And that is not unheard of. Right. You may think it's bizarre for something like an Anna Freud Institute to be involved, right? At that high level, you know, oh, it's academic. Oh, it's high professional standards, right? But uh, we've seen all these people with um, 
with uh, coming out of academia with uh, supposedly high professional standards who are running all kinds of scams, right? And a lot of them ran the National Institute of Mental of and National Institutes of Health. <laughs> I'm not going to name any names because I, I trust that you're smart enough to know um, who I'm re uh, referring to. Okay. So anyway, Clement Greenberg, um, they ran the Journals of Opinion. Um, after I gave up trying to be a Jewish comedian, I'd say, I can't be Shlomo Hamamoto. I'll never make it to the Ed Sullivan Show. I thought I would be a Jewish intellectual. So I subscribed to Dissent, Irving Howe's publication. You know, he edited it. These are all leftist. You know, their parents, grandparents were bolshies who set up these journals of opinion in New York City, later Washington, D.C. And that's another one of the reasons why we have a left-wing, read Diana West, government, because of the journals of opinion. Opinions mean something. Intellectual work means something. I'm just trying to explain to you the process of how it works. So I wanted to be a contributor to commentary. I wanted to, to contribute to dissent. I wanted to contribute smart, you know, smart, bright, intelligent, incisive, insightful articles and reviews, movie, book reviews to um, to the nation, right? Which and I have subscriptions to all of them because I, you know, the 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 Jewish comedian shtick didn't work out. So that second best deal shtick would be for me would be to intellectual world, and I was not accepted there either. Right. And my work's good. My work, I can hold, you know, my head up high in any intellectual company. Right. And that's not me saying, just check out my resume if you have the, because I brag enough about myself. But they wouldn't give me the time of day. The only one that did, by the way, was Z Magazine. And it was because it was a lower level type, not lower level, but it was a lower circulation New left. It wasn't run by this old fart named Irving Howe or Michael Walzer or there was Karen. These guys are all from City College of New York. They're all aspiring. They were trying to get over Norman Podhoritz, Midge Dekta. I knew all their names. All their all the intellectual histories have been written. Woody Allen admired them. He wished he was a New York intellectual. He subscribed to all that stuff. That's why there's so much pseudo-intellectual bunk in his pedophilic movies. The Woodman, Woodrow Allen Konigsberg, better known as another Yerav Rab who anglicized his name. But that's what I'm telling you this. I'm confessing to you that I understand this. I was never admitted on the inside. But I understood it and I studied it and aspired to it. Thank God I was never admitted. I might have thought, hey, I'm a New York intellectual. Yeah, before you know it, I'm going to be a part of a think tank in Washington, D.C. I'm going to be brought in the Booking Institute. I'm going to have a cushy job at, at the Stanford uh, uh, re Research uh, Phallic Tower over there in Palo Alto. Right, All these different tax-free foundation-run think tanks that, that war game conflicts, future and present conflicts, such as Ukraine. And I, that could have been me. Professor Habamoto could have been a real minch. Amaka. These are all Yiddish words. If you want a reference, look at Leo Rostin's The Joy of Yiddish. I was that much into it. I didn't study Hebrew. Didn't, I was never, I didn't go through, um, um, through, you know, through the ritual and study and all that. Uh, it was secondhand. It was thirdhand. I only got it from the records. I don't Sherman and watching, reading Mad Magazine. And William Gaines was another Yerav Rav. Gaines was his anglicized name. That's how I learned stuff. That's cool. They're, these are the people. And, and the movie makers, the filmmakers, the writers, right? Including Abraham Polanski. By the way, we got to hand it to um, uh, Saul Newton. Apparently, someone checked it out. Apparently, he fought in the Spanish um, Civil War. He fought against fascism, or the Italian version of socialism, which we call fascism. Yeah. He was part of this, I don't know if it was Abraham Lincoln. Brigade. This is where, you know, people like um, uh, 
George Orwell got their bones. These were this is the days when the real journalists, the real novel, the writers, the real fiction of people put their ass on the line in the line of fire to understand real world problems, not CRT or LGBTQ, but real power politics on the on the field of battle. You know, read homage to Catalonia. That is George Orwell's account of him not being a combatant in the Spanish Civil War. I think he was helping out in, in a civilian capacity reporting. Um, I think maybe he maybe did some Red Cross work. I don't know. But but he got a bullet in the throat anyway. It didn't matter if he was a soldier or not. He was shot in the throat. That's that's George Orwell, right? These are the... These are the artists I respect who paid their dues, not the pop-up pundits on YouTube, right? Not the newbies who, who, you, who proliferate everywhere because that is part of the tactic, by the way, the PR tactic. I learned there's a term for it. When a certain side is winning, a certain point of view, a certain political movement is gaining more momentum, what does, what do the public relations, which is a, it's a Ralph Rob profession, by the way. Public relations, spinning, you know, advertising. It's just it's the same thing, virtually, right? What do they do? It's what happened. That's why I, I have 11,000 subscribers, right? That's why the newbies who obviously are reading stuff that's been scripted for them and they don't know what they're talking about. They have, well, not that I lived through the Civil War, but I mean... I met the guy who uh, wrote the, the definitive book on the history of the civil. I don't know if it's definitive, but one of the main books of uh, the Spanish Civil War. His name is Murray Bookchin. He was an anarchist who comes from one of these bullshy families. See, these are the people whose talks I attended and listened to and whose books I read. Later, he moved into the green moon. This is Murray Bookchin. But he started out as, a, as an anarchist. And uh, I learned later that... Um, God, what's his name? All the other anarchists hate him because he was so not he was because these bullshies were a bunch of thugs. They're a bunch of bullies. They would loud talk you. And if they weren't winning their argument, they would ridicule you. Ah, bam, 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 bam. Yeah, they squinch their face like they're in pain, like because you're an idiot. That's a bullshit tactic. And if they couldn't do that, they'll beat you up or get their thugs on you. All right. I'm not saying Murray Bookchin was was did that, but but that's how he was characterized by his own, by, by people who were um, uh, in his area. And I, I, I met some of the, I can't remember his name now. Yeah, I uh, had dinner with, how can I forget him? Anyway, I'll, I'll, he, he was at UC Dave. He was a former professor at UC Davis of, um, of uh, creative writing. And one of, them, one of America's major poets, whose name, of course, I can't remember right now. I'm thinking too much about <coughs> other realms, right? That's that's my excuse, at least. Um, whereas, whereas I don't know, Maria Bookchin all of a sudden came back to the fore. So let's go on here, and uh, I got I should start winding up here um, with the um, Sullivan Institute, and let's remind ourselves who Uncle Ziggy Freud really was. All right. He was uh, chased out of uh, Vienna. He was Austrian, not German. Um, he was already having uh, health problems, but then he'd already secured through ruthless intellectual. I don't know if he had anybody beat up, but we're talking about about warfare here, right? Uh, info, information, propaganda, intellectual warfare. There is such a thing, right? It might have been, been included violence i don't know but by the time freud was to leave um austria i think he needed maybe a stop in paris and he, he did make a short visit to america by the way i think it was what clark university something like that i think it was stanley hall invited them that's when freud mania really started to take off um but by the time he moved to london he was already Pretty much gone because he had snorted too much cocaine. He'd smoked too many cigars. 
he had had one too many brandies and whatever else that um, other ailments that he had, you know. So he only got to live for about a one more year in this house before he died in London. So let's take a like a, a revisit of Uncle Frank, because this is where it really kind of starts. And that's where Harry Stack Sullivan starts, who I didn't even get a chance to talk to or talk about, because it's called the Sullivan Institute, named after Harry Stack Sullivan, who, by the way, was Irish American. He was not a Rev Rav, but he was not a Sylvanian. I mean, most people who remember Harry Stack says, these people have nothing to do with Harry Stack Sullivan. It doesn't matter. You know, does Benny Hanna have anything to do with Japanese food? No, not at all. But Harry Stacks, he's another case. He was a closet, it turns out he was a closeted queer, which also makes, and now I understand his psychology. I mean, his his book, I was introduced to his work when I was an undergraduate in American intellectual history. Harry Stacks, I just took it for what it was and I forgot about it. Then it came to this book again. And I said, okay, I'm going to, Revisit Harry Stack, and I recent and I found out that he was in the military. He was in intelligence. He was trying to assess people for psychological fitness to the U.S. military. And the military said no, gays should not be in the military. Harry Stack Sull Sullivan said yes. He did not win at that time. Eventually, he did win. So he should be remembered during Pride Month. Harry Stack Sullivan. He should have his own flag flown next year. I'm going to have a Harry Stack. Sullivan gay pride flag flown here and, and celebrate him is because a gay pride pride month is redundant. American history is full of people who are of homosexual behavior, organ, origin, or belief. So why do we need to celebrate the obvious? It, that's not so obvious. They were they were um, held in embargo until uh, the whole transhumanist program can be brought. Then it started to come up because reproduction no longer became necessary. So we're going to promote gay and, and we're going to call it lifestyle. And we're going to have the Sullivan Institute to break down the family. Right. And we, we have it all set up. And believe me, if you don't think it was workshopped, because I mean, I make it sound like it was all planned out. If you don't think it wasn't planned, then you probably think that the Space Brothers created you. Right. You are the product of, you know, people from Al Alpha Centauri, not God, and that they're going to come here in a, in a spacecraft from Aldebaran or wherever it is, and they're going to rescue you from planet, right? Because it's all been planned and ordained. It's a lot of Gnostic people. That's all a lot of New Agers. Oh, yeah. So let's take a look at this one preacher man who went to the side of uh, uh, Uncle Siggy's last home he was only there for a year and he talks about it from his perspective i think it's very important to get the perspective of individuals such as this gentleman here he doesn't identify himself i'm gonna try to look into his website a little bit more or his uh, youtubes and i'm gonna leave us on that i'll, I'll come back up to the vi video is gone but i want to leave us um on this note because this is where we have to go this is the direction we have to go and we and we can do it this gentleman and his small group of pamphleteers are on the streets trying to turn back over 100 years of this history of this hegemonic behavioral system called psychotherapy psychotherapy right here we go Welcome to our ministry. We've been on a ministry outreach in London. Uh, we were in King's Cross yesterday. We're going to Charing Cross tomorrow, giving Bible tracts out and our, our wonderful banner, which has been all over the world, and you've probably seen it in many of our videos, will be raised high later. But in this ministry, whenever we go anywhere, we try to get a little bit of history, secular history, unfortunately, but not so much spiritual history. And if you watched our video in Scotland a while ago, you saw that we looked at Lockerbie, Bible John and Madeline Smith, the Madeline Smith case. Now today we are in Finchley and in front of you you see the house of Dr. Sigmund Freud. Now Sigmund Freud has always been a very interesting character to me, but a little bit of background. He was born in 1856. He mainly practiced most of his work in Vienna and that's where he developed his idea of psychoanalyst, neurologist, 
degree in examining and helping people who suffered from what they called mental problems then. But what is of interest to me is that whilst he was working uh, in Vienna, he had a partnership then with Carl Jung and they worked together from 1907 to 1912. But the whole thing about this uh, psychiatrist is that a whole new language was born which came from these two men. You've got to remember that the words I'm going to give you in the next few minutes were words which had been unheard of, you know, 70 or 80 years ago. So let's run through some of them, see if you know what they are. Libido, there's one of them. It's a word you hear a great deal of. Neurosis, Freudian slip. How did you hear that said? Oh, it was a Freudian slip. You can see where it came from. The Oedipus complex. Mind games, dreams, id, ego super ego and of course two of the expressions which some say came from Freud some say were come Carl Jung or maybe were produced when they worked together introvert and extrovert most of us have heard the expressions and probably most of us could say yes I'm an introvert no I'm an extrovert but we know what they mean and these are all the language of the psychoanalyst and when he comes to do some work now of course what happened was that Freud was working in Vienna and in 1938 Hitler did the Anschluss and of course the Nazis came to Vienna. Freud had had a practice there with his daughter and of course his daughter was arrested by the Gestapo for questioning and probably Freud was going to be next. Now it seems that he had some very influential friends in England in the Jewish community who were able to arrange emergency visas for the consul there to bring him to England. And this beautiful house here was arranged by a man called uh, Lord Hor Belisha, the man who did the Belisha beacons in England, you know what I'm talking about. And this is where he came. He wasn't here for very long, he was here for but less than a year, I think, before he died of uh, terrible facial cancer and so forth. But this is the museum. Um, interesting man, the Hasidic Jewish background, possibly had it drummed into him to like so many of these other people, rejected God and all it stood for, certainly directed the, uh, the one God aspect of it all and said that really people need to find their own God, to find themselves through their own personality. But uh, here we are, just a little bit of background on all of this and I should say that uh, my son James has done a wonderful documentary on Oliver Cromwell, I think he's called the Lord Protector of England and the interesting thing there is a Freud connection that in 1889, 99, Sigmund Freud came to London with the idea of having a statue erected outside Parliament for Oliver Cromwell and he wanted to be part of that. He gave some money towards the erection of this statue. It was a public conscription, anybody could put that money towards it. Now I don't know what, how much he gave but he wanted to be there for that. The statue's still there. James was down there uh, last year doing some filming, went up to Scotland, did some more. But if you want to see that statue, you better be quick because there's a lot of work being done in Parliament at the moment. And at the moment, the statue is quite a way back from the roadway behind railings. When I first went to London 50, 60 years ago, you could walk past it and you could see the statue, you could touch it, but they've stopped there. And our view is, both James and myself, that as Parliament is going to be closed for a couple of years, as it modernise it, up to date it, health and safety reasons, the statue will be removed, possibly sent to some museum somewhere else there. Now, Sigmund Freud was so impressed by Oliver Cromwell and his kind disposition to the Jews in England that he named his son Oliver and not much more you could say about that. So that's the connection between Oliver Cromwell. Try and catch James's uh, documentary on it. But uh, it's a wonderful house, wonderful garden I must say. I'm always interested in gardens and horticulture and what they're growing. It's beautifully maintained, wonderful manicured lawn there. I wouldn't dare walk on it but it's a beautiful lawn anyway. Uh, some of our group are looking in there, but we've been able to do some tracking as we hear there, give some Bible tracks out in the area. Mmm, lovely, beautiful rose. I'm reminded of a song, as we're here at the Freud Museum, written by the great songwriter of the 20th century, Lorenz Hart, who I think was probably one of the greatest poets of the 20th century. And he wrote a song, and one of the lines were, Sigmund Freud has often stated, dreams and drives are all related. And he even got Schopenhauer in there, who was one of the great influences of Sigmund Freud. That's all for what it's worth, but it shows even the, the great songwriters in Hollywood were interested in Sigmund Freud. Thank you. Well, we're still finishing our um, little project we did on the house of Sigmund Freud. We were there this morning. Uh, we've been... 
if you'll bear with me for just a few more minutes, I think this is going to be well worth it. People hear about the Tavistock Institute, all, all the pop-up pundits like to talk about us and use something. But here it is. You're going to get you're going to get be able to see the Tavistock Institute in Tavistock Square. I've been there. I've not been in it, but I've been around there. I miss the Freud Museum. I had too much. I wanted to go see EMI uh, Studios, better known as Abbey Road, and other uh, tourist spots. But maybe next time I'll, you know, I'll, I'll go through the museum. But here you go, Tavistock Institute, and also this uh, pastor talks about the occultic uh, interest, the material as well as metaphysical interest in the occult, which he shared with uh, Jung, and which has migrated down to the present day, 2023. This is the root of our current problem in the United States of America. It's not Vladimir Putin. Pick any name. It's not Kamala Harris. It's not the Chatcoms. We turned away from God. All right, let's get back to this. Told that there's a statue near here, and actually we have found it, but it's very close, as you see, to the controversial Tavistock Center. This has long been a t controversial clinic, very much into a lot of the problems which Sigmund Freud was working on and trying to examine. So I, I think probably this is why the statue which we're going up now to look at was probably tied in here. We've got to remember the whole of this area is really Sigmund Freud area. Just up the road, I know you can't see it, but on the left is Maresfield Gardens, where Freud moved to just before the First World, Second World War, I should say. I'm sorry, the Second World War. And in 1970, the local authorities, possibly money from the government, commissioned a statue to be built just up here, and we're just coming up to it now, of Sigmund Freud. And I think it's very fortuitous and very interesting that it is near the Tavistock Clinic. And there it is, there is the statue. Bit of a high hedge here, maybe you can see it through there, ah oh, yeah. Is. Cast in bronze, of course, 1970. Uh, lasted well, but you'd expect it to. Very good likeness, I think. Um, and there it is, on the corner of the road as he watches the traffic go by. Of course, looking at the museum this morning, there were very, very many dubious artifacts there from ancient Egypt the Byzantine Empire, the Roman Empire, a lot of it into the occult, sorcery, black magic. And he had over 2,000 objects shipped in from his home or office in Vienna to here in Finsbury Park. That's how much the man must have thought of it, to transport 2,000 artifacts of ancient Egypt. You've got the gods there, Seti, you've got Osis and Osiris and all the rest of them. But they must have meant a lot to this man very, very dangerous. It's all the occult, it's all black magic. And somebody did say to me this morning, and we're going to look into it, we wonder whether Alistair Crowley ever met Freud, or Freud ever met Alistair Crowley. I think they'd have a lot in common. And there he sits, watching over. And I think so much of his psychiatry has done so much damage to so many people. The brain is such a sensitive thing. We're a Christian ministry, of course. We bring all our troubles to the Lord. We ask him to help us to do all of these things. But once you get into what this man was recommending, and many of the times high on cocaine and so forth, it seems very dubious to me. Well, that's it, wrapping it up now on Sigmund Freud. We hope you've enjoyed it. We hope you enjoyed Ruth Ellis as well. And uh, pray for us tomorrow. We're out in the streets of London, giving Bible tracts out. We know the Lord's coming back. Blessings and Maranatha. Okay, we'll leave it at that high note. I'll be revisiting the topic, not of the Sullivan Institute per se, but about the uh, Gnostic takeover of American politics, society, culture, and all its significant institutions. Some of them are absolutely jubilant about that takeover, including, I haven't read the book yet, but maybe I'll review it in this on this channel here. Her name's uh, April... D. McConnick. And uh, oh, she has an endowed chair. Ooh. Carol and uh, Percy Turner, professor of biblical studies and the chair of the Department of Religion at Rice University. 
Okay, and this is a Columbia University publication. And the title is telling, it's called The Gnostic New Age, How a Countercultural Spirituality Revolutionized Religion from Antiquity to Today, right? So I am warning of that historical process of which the Sullivan Institute was um, both a contributor and beneficiary of and extended it. Um, she's celebrating it. And I think it's a premature celebration because you and me, the American people in general, right? Once we understand, just like after we figured out the, the dark forces that were behind the Ellen DeGeneres phenomenon, the Oprah Winfrey phenomenon, that whole Santa Barbara S Center for the Study of Democratic Institution, also the place where the so-called royals have settled and all these movie star and, and banking type. Once we understand that it goes, the, the, that information, that energy, if I can <laughs> delve into the metaphysical, goes out there and look what happens. It manifests itself. I mean, I think we're, we're going to see a change. And I think we're going to see transformation in the larger um, religious, the spiritual culture in America. A revival, but not a cheesy revival, not a Joel Osteen mega church revival, not a 5013C revival, but a, re a true organic revival across America. North and South, East, West. So with that good news, <laughs> I bid you, ladies and gentlemen, a fond farewell for now, right? Goodbye. And I'll be back with you, God willing, next Sunday with more exciting news and analysis. Thanks again. Bye.